So let's get started with the basic principles of DNA copy number uh, estimation. So um, the idea is that what you're trying to measure is uh, copies of DNA. So if you have probes that are placed across the genome at different positions, uh, these probes are placed on a microarray, and each of them probes a particular position, and they can be at any point as long as you have the probe mapping uh, file. Uh, then the experiment is such: you take the test sample and uh, you color that DNA in green, your reference sample in red, and these are just made up colors, of course. And you combine them and hybridize onto an array CTH platform. So. If you have the same amount, so if you have two copies, it's deployed of both your test and reference, uh, you have equal amounts of green and red, which forms these yellow spots. So everywhere on the genome ends up being yellow. Now, if you have more of a particular area, like here we have more of the T arm of chromosome 1, and uh, the Q arm has a deletion, so there's more green for the probes that map to this location, so those probes end up being greener and the probes that we have less uh, material in our test sample than the reference end up being in red. Uh, so we end up with this red, yellow, and green profile. Now, if you look at the actual numbers for that, um, the measurement, not the color, so you get in the experiment channel, you end up with some measure, let's say, of 150, and the control would be 100. So you have a ratio of 3 over 2 or we work in a log 2 space, so the log 2 of that is 0.57. For the next probe, you have 300 over 200, same ratio, 0.57. And when you have equal amount in both channels, the log ratio becomes 0. And if you have less in your test than in your control, you end up with a negative log ratio. And typically, that's plotted um, as such, so you have on the genome like this, so you end up saying, ah, these probes that are above 0 at 0.57, this is an area of gain. This is normal. They're right at 0. And the losses are where we have negative numbers. So this is a very um, simple, basic concept of the race CTA. Now, there's a lot of interest in next generation sequencing and uh, using that type of data for making copy number estimations. And in some sense, it's, it's quite simple and, and analogous. So in NGS, uh, using NGS technologies, you have a relatively short read. And if you, if you have corrected for different biases, uh, application biases, GP biases, the number of reads that you get at a particular uh, position in the genome should indicate some relative amount of the, the DNA. So if you bin up the, the genome into multiple bins and count, so we have six reads here, six reads here, seven, so on and so forth. And you plot that. Let's say you had 6x coverage on, on average, and you end up with 14. So this part might be a gain, um, again, if you have corrected for biases. One way of correcting for biases would be to do like a array CGH, do a competitive, not a competitive, do a comparative uh, approach. So you compare a test. Uh, to a reference. So if we assume this is a reference, and here's test sample, and uh, you use the same protocol for measurement, you can then say, well, you know, in each bin, I'm counting nine here versus six, so you can create a log ratio. So at an area like here, where you have like no reads versus where you had high reads before, this might indicate a loss. So you can transform that data into what we look at like an array CGA. So essentially, you can treat the NGF data as if um, it came from array or back arrays or anything. So um, it, it, everything else I'm going to talk about could be applied then to the NGF derived data. So here's a, an example, a more realistic example, that probes no longer just land perfectly on 0.57. There's some noise involved here. And if you look at this data, one way of, of deciding where the gain and losses are is you say, well, these probes are on 0.57. That must be a gain. This guy is low down here. That must be a loss, gain, normal. 
and you can kind of go through the, the genome like that. Uh, on the other hand, you could say, well, you know, I'm not so sure about that, that single probe. That might be a noise that's in the system, so I might have a complete gain here. Uh, similar with this point, that might actually be noise and part of the normal effect. And uh, with this guy there, that might be a noise, so the whole thing could be a lot. How would you know um, that that's a noise or not? I mean, frankly, you wouldn't necessarily know. Um, off of that, you can hope with some statistics that based on the distribution of the probe, you have certain confidence that um, this is, is really noise or not. It should be incorporated. So we'll get to that in the next session. So before looking at statistical approaches, a simple, very crude approach, which is, was initially uh, proposed, would be to just count the number of probes that are above the zero line. So if you say, take a window of five probes and slide it, say, okay, when I have five sequential probes that are above the zero line, I call that a gain. So here I get five, I get a gain. And as I move the windows, that's pretty much it. Um, it doesn't, it's not the best method because it can make bad calls. So in a case like here, you have five probes that are slightly above zero config, uh, just by chance, and that becomes a gain. And in this case, because you have an outlier, you never get five probes in a row. Um, and this potentially real gain will not be called. So statistical methods have been developed that try to give you a better solution on making calls, and that's going to be part of the next uh, session.